Let's, let's talk about the dollar liquidity crisis. What it mean by that and kind of why you're concerned? There's two dollar liquidity crises undergoing right now. Okay. One is the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, talked about the $15 trillion that foreigners have borrowed. The problem is, is when you go into a slowing economic cycle, the world trade is in dollars. World trade is currently negative. So therefore, they don't have the dollars to either pay back their debts or service their debts. Um, and that becomes a problem. So that tends to drive the dollar higher in periods of stress because there's too much money. There is also a European banking system that's starved of dollars. And because of regulatory differences, a dollar in the United States and a dollar in Europe is not the same thing. They're not fungible anymore. So we had something called the euro dollar market, which is the offshore dollar market and the onshore funding market, and they were fungible. So Deutsche Bank could have a US operation and fund its European operations from it. That stopped. So basically you've got two different currency systems, which has led to the shortage of dollars offshore, mm -hmm. which is why there's this endless problem with the European banking system is there's not enough dollars to make that run because the world actually runs on dollars and not euros. Mm -hmm. Euros are a big part of it, but the dollar is what you actually need. So if you then think of the other part of this equation is, okay, in a slowdown, stuff like the oil price falls. Well, oil is another bunch of economies that extract things out of the ground and get paid US dollars for them. You get less dollars. So you either have to pump more oil and watch the oil price fall, which is basically what the shale guys are doing right now. Uh, the Saudis did it in 2014, and the oil price went to 30 bucks, um, and they're reticent to do it again. Because um, basically what they're doing is they're flooding the market with supply and to get dollars. The, the supply demand imbalance leads to a lower exchange price, but they are trying to, on an aggregate basis, get the same number well, of dollars. Well, let's, yes, because let's say you have to pay your costs of, of operational servicing debt and other yep. stuff is $10 a year. Well, and if you get it all from oil, and your income from oil is $40 a year, well, if, if oil goes to if the oil falls seventy percent, you can't service your debts, mm -hmm. so they're incentivized to just sell more oil to get the, the fixed number of dollars in, which mm -hmm. is what the shale guys are doing to try and pay their debts because they're about to blow up, mm -hmm. and it's the panic reaction that's why they're pumping more and more and more because mm -hmm. they're going to blow up. Because it goes from to, a premium price play to a volume play. Exactly that. That's exactly the point. It's a, a dollar at any cost. Yep. Um, so, so that's the that is what's going on in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. The Bank of England and all the central banks have said this is a huge problem. It is uncontrolled now, and they don't know what the outcomes are. This is the rise of the central bank digital currency because they know they have to do something. Mm -hmm. Transfer mechanisms are broken. There's a whole bunch of issues of which I don't understand, mm -hmm. but the central banks are clearly screaming that we need to move away, not from the dollar as a standard because there is no other alternative yet, um, but even as a mechanism. So I don't even quite know what this means yet, mm -hmm. but there's something big coming. We'll talk about that later. So, so when you're sitting there... But sorry, there's onshore, there's a funding problem as well, because okay. everyone's at the repo borrowing money. So it's telling you there's funding issues everywhere right now, and there's not enough dollars in the system. Even though the dollar is not going up per se, what you will see is it starting to explode against the things like the Brazilian real, the Turkish lira, the South African rand. All the weakest borrowers have the problems first. Explain the repo market. Like, like, how does that fit in? The answer is I don't really know mm -hmm. because almost nobody knows. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what's actually happening, or we don't know why it's happening. We we partly know why and we partly know what, but we don't know the whole picture. Okay. But what I'm hearing is that again, it's just changed again because the narrative was, you know, we've just supplied the repo market. It was fine. There was a bit of stress on a few hedge fund balance sheets and prime brokers, and it wasn't stress. They couldn't get the right funding levels and uh, and various issues with the inversion of the curve, creating a shortness and some technical nature. But it's just come screaming back again mm -hmm. in the last few days with JP Morgan saying, well, we, just, we don't want to say make it look like it's a bad thing, so we're going to borrow money. Next minute, every bank's, you know, something's going on in the repo markets. Again, and I think there is liquidity stress with some of these larger hedge funds, and I don't know whether it's Citadel, not meaning they necessarily are losing money, but they can't get the money that they need to pay, whether it's, it could be margin calls, but it could just be general funding requirements. Yeah. So again, it doesn't have to be catastrophic, and I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not one who buys into the arguments that somebody's going under. 
It could be, because yeah. it's clearly showing some stress. It could be that there's a problem deeper buried within, and I don't know what that is. Well, and I don't think people understand how over leveraged even the hedge funds are, right? In, in terms of. Well, some are, some aren't. Okay, explain. So if you are somebody like, and I'm just using Citadel as an example because they're not even really a hedge fund any longer, but they use huge amounts of le leverage to basically create price liquidity because mm -hmm. they're a market maker in volatility, in price, in equities, in bonds, in in whatever it may be, they're the marginal provider of liquidity, basically. And there's several other firms like them. And they also keep in line all the arbitrage because the banks don't have capital to trade this stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. So they've basically done what the banks did, which is arbitrage the parts of the curve and the, keep the money markets in line with the euro dollar market and the Fed funds market and do all of this stuff. Problem is, is if suddenly their funding, which they need huge funding for, they could be 100 times levered. 100 times levered, and they are. That's wild. Yeah. Um, and they are, I don't know how many billion dollars Citadel is as a firm now. Um, no and again, I'm not picking on Citadel, I have no idea. But th these firms are have huge leverage because they're very low risk. Mm -hmm. But all of these have that risk of picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, mm -hmm. that some things can go wrong. So there is, a, there is a problem that could come from that. They're very smart people, have the best systems in the world, the best risk management. They're exceptionally good at what they do. But if you just take the funding level up by a few basis points, it screws up all of their P&L. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a real problem. And then they start tipping out risk. Yeah, so you were talking about central banks a second ago and, and just mentioned funding levels. Um, whenever we get close to these periods, they've got two tools uh, historically. They can cut rates and they can print more money. Um, we have obviously seen them say that they're not printing money in the quantitative easing sense, but uh, balance sheets have expanded 400 billion or so um, over the last couple of months. Uh, we obviously just saw the rate cut. If you were running one of these central banks, let's say the Federal Reserve, for example, what do you do in order to at least mitigate some of the damage that appears to be coming, if not See, try to stop I it? I am not a buyer in belief that central banks are evil. Okay. I think they're a function of the demographics that they've been presented. Okay. And yes, they've made some mistakes in terms of creating, for example, part of the equity market bubble. I also think most of it was driven by retirees or mm -hmm. baby boomers mm -hmm. trying to save retirement and, and the corporate tax break mm -hmm. that allows corporations to buy. So, yeah, so I don't think it's just to do with interest rates are low. I think interest rates are low for a reason. Mm -hmm. I think growth has been the lowest this cycle than any other cycle in all recorded history. I think that as baby boomers move into retirement, if you think the relative marginal buying of a 25-year-old and the relative marginal buying of a 60-year-old are massively different. Mm -hmm. So your marginal impact on the economy falls over time and what happens is it tends to slow economic growth and we've seen it all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the closer you get to retirement or into retirement, the less you spend. Mm -hmm. So it has a big lowering of growth, so inflation falls with it. Yes, and people will say, but my inflation's not. Yes, everyone's got a different rate of inflation. That's what people have to realize, you know? Um, yeah, okay, Ex explain that a little bit more because I think when people hear that, they're like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I did this, I wrote about it in, in Global Macro Investor. Um, I said, I took a, a bunch of things and I said, okay, I'm gonna take a pair of jeans that I remember buying mm -hmm. when I was a kid and I'm gonna take the stereo that I bought around the same time and I'm going to compare like for like, and then I'm going to compare a different rate of inflation for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I worked it out on a on a um, you know hourly earnings adjusted basis just to get a like for like. So the pair of jeans that I bought at the time, and again I'm just I can't remember. I wrote about this seven or eight years ago. P pair of jeans I bought at the time was thirty quid in the UK, and they were expensive designer jeans. You're styling. I was you know, <laughs> I was I was so pleased. I begged my mum for these jeans. A pair of Levi's was about twenty. Okay. So it's a 50% premium to a pair of Levi's, and the Levi's were the standard jean. So you cut to when I wrote the article, and I haven't checked this, uh, and the stereo that I bought I think was £100. No, I, I looked at a high-end stereo, I looked at a high-end quad stereo, I looked at a couple of other things. Anyway, the point being is basic goods were exactly the same price, or less. So the Levi's were basically inflation adjusted less. Um, the stereos were much less. What was interesting is the expensive jeans were like five times more expensive or 10 times more expensive. And the high-end stereo was like 10 times more expensive. So, and what I'm showing there was that if you were slightly wealthier, 
your rate of inflation was about 15% or so, I, I calculated, mm -hmm. while the CPI over the same period would have been about like two and a half or three. So different people, now if I... And you're um, saying different people is really, you're different, you and I would be different because we buy different types of goods and those different types of goods actually, correct. the price appreciation. And, and our relative, yeah. um, our fixed cost base is the, is, is the important matter mm -hmm. within this. So healthcare is a huge proportion of some people's mm -hmm. CPI, right? It's not a massive proportion of my CPI, but it's a huge proportion of somebody else. Um, and so that's why when they see inflation, it's enormous for them. Mm -hmm. When they see kids' school inflation, university inflation, why university inflation? Why? Because we had the second biggest generation of people all going to university at the same time. Of course there was going to be inflation. Mm -hmm. They drove it. Um, you know, so th different people have different inflation rates. And I, so I think the notion, the notion of a CPI is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the people who hate the Fed for hiding the numbers, I, th I think it's because everybody has a different CPI. So going back to if you're sitting there and you're Jerome Powell, what do you do? Do so, we go to zero? Do we go to negative? Do we look, print a bunch of money? I think what, there's what a do do? fair argument that whatever they do makes no difference now. I have a feeling that they will have to intervene and support the pension system at the end of this. Come a little closer to the mic. Sorry. Um, I think they're going to have to support the pension system at the end of this. So there is a lot of monetary printing to come, mm -hmm. and it's a natural consequence of the aging population and the promises given to it. Mm -hmm. Now, just to clarify, this is rate cuts to zero plus the money printing, or are those two things separate? Well, I don't think they have a choice but to cut to zero. Yeah. Everybody else in the world is zero. So Donald Trump is right. You know, it's, it's an anomaly, and, it, and it's pointless. Mm -hmm. So cut it to zero. No, it's not going to cause a stock market bubble because we're in the middle of something much bigger, mm -hmm. much more important. So... The issue is then what happens, mm -hmm. right? And the only answer that we currently have in the system that we currently are given is fiscal stimulus funded by government, uh, by central bank. There is no other answer. And this gets us into uh, if that money printing occurs, uh, <laughs> how does it get injected into? You're the just system? getting a long story of how we get to Bitcoin, but carry on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm uh, <laughs> dropping breadcrumbs the whole way. I can see uh, them. Uh, 